section one of captain cook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Captain Cook by Walter Besant. Chapter 1. Birth and Education, Part 1. James Cook was born in the little village of Martin in that part of Yorkshire known as Cleveland. He came into the world on the 27th day of October in the year 1728. His father, an agricultural laborer, removed by a single step from the lowest level is said by one writer to have been a native of northumberland and by others to have come from the village of ednam in roxburgh the birthplace of thompson the poet the village of martin presents few points of interest the cottage in which cook was born was taken down a hundred years ago and part of a great house which in its turn is now gone was built over its site the place is at present occupied by a plantation the only relic of cook's childhood is a pump called captain cook's pump constructed it is said by his father probably it was the pump in use by the tenants of the cottage the village consists of a long street of red brick houses few of them old the church was rebuilt in eighteen forty eight and most of the tombs in the churchyard are new james seems to have been the second of a large family of seven or eight or even more at a very early age he was set to work on the farm of one william walker a wealthy yeoman of martin mary walker his wife seems to have taken the trouble to teach the child his letters this is the origin of the dame school and the village dame of which so much is made in hartley's coleridge memoir mary walker lived to the age of eighty-nine dying in the year seventeen eighty nine ten years after her pupil it is hoped that this good lady knew that the lad to whom she had shown a little kindness was none other than the great sailor who filled the world with his name at the age of eight in the year seventeen thirty six the boy was removed to the village of great ayton between four and five miles south of martin here his father became hind to mr scoto then lord of the manor great ayton which boasts an illustrious roll of proprietors had passed by marriage from the colsons to the scotos it was sold early in the century to a family named richardson the word hind is generally interpreted to mean bailiff the practice in the cleveland district was then and is still for the landlord to place a man in charge of a small farm giving him the farmhouse for his residence and paying him fixed wages receiving in return the whole produce of the farm this tenant or paid labourer is called the landlord's hind doubtless this was the position held by james cook the elder at great ayton four more children at least were born to the family and four died and are buried in the churchyard here also in the year seventeen sixty eight captain cook's mother died aged sixty three happy we may hope in the knowledge that one of her sons was in command of a king's ship the village of great ayton is a much more considerable place than martin and far more interesting it lies close to the north or northwest edge of that splendid stretch of hill and moorland called the cleveland hills or the moors well known to all who love whitby and her daughters the seaside hamlets each in its glen built on the slopes of the steep hills beside the sea the cleveland hills begin close to the village of ayton north of it runs the long ridge of longbar and east of it rises the picturesque hill called rosebury topping a thousand feet high crowned with its conical peak of sandstone through the village runs a beck which is crossed by a wide stone bridge on the south side of the stream evidently the poorer part of the village stands the house where cook's father dwelt it is said to have been built by him when he gave up his post as hind and became a stonemason it is a stone cottage of three or four rooms with a red tiled roof and through the open door one catches a glimpse of a garden behind over the door is a stone with the initials j c g and the date seventeen fifty five if as is most probable these initials mean james cook and grace his wife the house was not built till the son was already twenty-seven years of age and long since flown from the paternal nest the father was also sixty 
and if he lived here must have given up his farm cook's biographers grandly tell us that the boy was placed in a day school at ayton and educated at mr scoto's expense this seems very magnificent and truly generous on the part of mr scoto i believe that this gentleman afterwards proved cook's friend at the most important juncture in his life when a single step decided his future but upon the generosity of the education one need not insist i have seen the school it was held on the ground floor of a cottage built originally as the inscription above the lintel informs us in seventeen o four by one michael postgate it was pulled down in the year seventeen eighty four and then rebuilt the later structure was of exactly the same size as the former no doubt as village schools then were the educational advantages of great ayton were considerable and a boy attending the school from the age of eight to that of twelve may have acquired a good foundation for anything which he might subsequently be able to build upon it the school has since been refounded and endowed and new buildings have been erected for it so that it has become a very creditable school indeed the village now contains a few old houses and a good number which betoken a certain amount of comfort and wealth there is a large square with a very good inn on the other side of the brook is an irregular place surrounded by old and somewhat squalid cottages the old church has been deserted and suffered to fall into decay and a new church has been built and a new churchyard close to the old the effect is not pleasing though the mouldering church in the midst of its graves all forgotten and neglected together is not without its touch of pathos a monument stands in the churchyard erected by captain cook to the memory of his mother his father who lived to be eighty-five died at redcar on april first seventeen seventy nine where he lived with his daughter margaret who was married to a fisherman there he is described in the register of deaths as a day labourer the son of a hind of scotch descent afterwards a stonemason and of a yorkshire woman of like position and parentage james cook had little backing from his family and his connections yet if we were to have chosen an ancestry which in those days would have given a boy the best chance of success it would have been difficult to choose a better stock on both sides on the one hand the scotch patience intelligence and industry and on the other the yorkshire independence and self-reliance add to this a quality especially essential to success in that century of endurance hard fare and continual fighting the power of contenting himself with the simplest life under the hardest conditions what the common sailor endured with grumbling captain cook endured with cheerfulness this also he owed as much to his parentage as to the habits of early life when the boy reached his thirteenth year and it was time to look about for him it was resolved to apprentice him to one sanderson a shopkeeper of staithes or the staithes the existence of tombstones in great ayton churchyard bearing the name of sanderson seems to explain why the boy was sent to mr sanderson of staithes perhaps he was in some way connected with the family perhaps the sanderson of staithes let the sanderson of great ayton know that he was in want of a boy certainly the two places were then as far apart and as distinct from each other as york is now from london in one the population was wholly rural and agricultural in the other it was wholly seafaring between the two villages there lay an expanse more than fifteen miles across if one wanted a village by the sea surely redcar was nearer than staithes and whitby if one wanted a great commercial centre was as near but the boy was sent to staithes he would reach it by whatever path lay across the moor probably through lofthouse sacred to the memory of a loathly worm no doubt such an apprenticeship would seem to the simple village folk a chance of a rise in the world for their boy it was indeed a chance and the lad seized upon it yet not quite as they expected along this part of the yorkshire coast from red car round to flamborough head and bridlington high cliffs present their faces to the sea broken at intervals by narrow glens formed by little becks or brooks making their way to the sea in many of these glens lie nestled a village or a town whitby is such a town built in a narrow valley upon the banks of a stream 
robin hood's bay has such a town brunswick bay has another scarlborough is an overgrown example of this kind of fishing village the staithes is another example it is like the rest built in a narrow valley upon the banks of a little stream the valley is so narrow and so deep that the place is quite invisible whether one approaches it by the road or by the cliff one suddenly turns toward the sea by a steep and winding way and presently discerns the red roofs of the town below descending the road becomes a street narrow and of evil smell descending still further the street becomes the centre and market of the town with shops and public-houses a little farther and the beach appears high cliff on either hand the one on the north running up to a point and breaking down sheer this is called coburn nab and the other on the south called piercy nab a more rounded bluff both are of nearly the same height namely just over four hundred feet a bay is thus formed partly sheltered from the east but exposed to the north the staith is a wooden pier or sea-wall not that which was known to james cook when he became an apprentice here but one of much more recent construction piles of timber have been driven into the ground as far out to sea as possible in order to make a kind of groin and to break the force of the waves which come rolling in from the north with great strength in the bay there are dozens of boats lying moored side by side on the shore there are dozens of boats hauled up the boats in the bay are filled with nets and gear of all kinds mostly they are painted white with streaks of green blue or red among them are lying i know not if they came so far a hundred and fifty years ago the boats of penzance with their stern sails you may know them by their rig in the big smacks half a dozen men go out but two or three will venture out even in one of the little cobbles which are upset so easily unless dexterously managed the place appears to be prosperous though men grumble on the staith the fisher folk stand about all day long hands in pocket pipe in mouth no neapolitan could seem lazier but they are not lazy they are resting an hour after midnight they will be on board their craft outward bound for the german ocean in all weathers short of a gale and in all seasons even when the northeast wind benumbs them with its icy breath they are not lazy but ashore they love to sit and stand together all day long exchanging few words where the waves wash the beach and where they scent the fragrance of the fish lying on the shingle above the reach of high tide and where they can keep an eye upon the open and watch the ships that sail and steam past them on the horizon there is every indication of a trade by which many do live in comfort in the town the shops are conducted though doubtless on a more liberal scale precisely after the same methods as those prevalent a hundred years ago that is to say on one side of the door is the grocery department and on the other side the drapery so that those who make james cook apprentice to a draper do not lie nor do those who make him apprentice to a grocer since his master mr sanderson followed both these trades the fisher folk of the staiths at the present day are reported to be a moral and virtuous people largely composed of temperance men they are further said to be a religious folk belonging to one or other of the many nonconformist churches represented in the place the church of england which a year or two ago had nothing in the place but an upper chamber rivalling the conventicles in ugliness is reported perhaps wrongly to have a feeble following the parish church is at hinderwell on the cliff a mile or more away and it is in its churchyard that you will find the tombs of all the master mariners of the staiths in the time when james cook was apprentice here i suppose there were none of the dissenting chapels nonconformity was still a thing of the great towns and that such of the fisher folk as had any religion at all walked up the hill on sundays to hinderwell we may easily believe them to have been like all other fisher and sailor folk of the time a people given to much drink but never careless or reckless that kind of sailor is not common on the coast of yorkshire save in this matter of drink in which the people are now greatly reformed the place was much the same then as now the bright-eyed clear-skinned girls ran then as now lightly along the steep and narrow lanes and courts of the town carrying baskets of fish on their heads the wives sat in their porches in their sunbonnets talking and knitting the men lounged on the staith talking all day if it was fine and not too cold 
when it rained or snowed or when the east wind was too bitter even for their hardy frames they sat together in the bar of the cod and lobster the shoulder of mutton and the black lion drinking over a pipe of tobacco on the south side of the main street the narrow courts rose steep and confined each with its flight of steps beyond the bay under coburn nab they were building ships always one ship at least on the stocks perhaps a whaler perhaps a collier perhaps no more than a fishing smack or a cobble but all day long the cheerful hammer rang and the shipwrights went in and out among the fisher folk he who visits this quaint old yorkshire town when he stands upon the far side of the cod and lobster upon the wooden pier may in imagination rebuild a row of houses along the shore exactly similar to those which will stand upon the shore behind him such a row actually stood there in the year seventeen forty and among them was mr sanderson's double shop the grocery on one side and the drapery on the other under the counter let us hope that of the latter department where there would be fewer cockchafers beetles and earwigs slept the apprentice james cook all apprentices slept under the counter in those days in the morning he swept out the shop put things in their places they had not then arrived at dressing the windows this done he had his breakfast a hunch of bread a lump of fat bacon and a mug of small ale this dispatched all day long he fetched carried waited served and listened to the instructions of mr sanderson he also listened whenever he could get outside the shop to the talk of the seafaring men on the stave he heard many things strange and wonderful he heard how the men went forth at night in all weathers to catch the herring and the cod he heard how some of them had served on colliers and coasters and so knew all the ports and humours of each from whitby to wapping how some again had gone forth to the arctic seas and whalers and had met with perils many and various among the ice the bears and the great whales nay there were some who had been pressed into his majesty's service fought his majesty's battles and returned home again none the worse for their years afloat even though their backs bore marks of the captain's discipline End of section one section two of captain cook by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter one birth and education part two now to some boys when they hear such stories there falls upon their senses a longing so mighty that it overpowers them like the rats when the piper of hamelin first began like the children when his flute played a second time they hear strange voices they see imaginary splendours the washing of the waves upon the shore falls upon their ears like the sweetest music their hearts swell only to see a black collier beating up slowly against the wind and presently a voice not to be resisted calls upon them to arise and betake themselves to some place where they too can be received upon shipboard and become sailors for good or for evil alas this was generally in james cook's time for evil the sailor had then things to encounter the like of which we have now well nigh forgotten there was scurvy at sea there were ships too clumsy to answer helm there were worm-eaten bottoms there was foul water to drink and not enough of it salt junk to eat and not enough of that there were captains who could and sometimes did lash the flesh off the seaman's back for a word or a look of mutiny there were sharks ashore and there was the enemy afloat yet nothing not the warnings of the experienced or the history of terrible shipwrecks or the certain knowledge of these things could keep the young sailor ashore or make him prefer the counter to the deck james cook was such a boy he heard these voices and had these visions perhaps among the fisher folk of the staiths there may have been one or two who had sailed through the strait le mer and up the coast of chile and peru and even beyond and north of the island of california escaping from the spanish fleet and boldly tackling the biggest and strongest spanish ship and so across the great pacific ocean on the parallel of latitude thirteen degrees north to the isle of guam 
whence through friendly seas and round the cape of good hope home there came a time when he could resist no longer and he fled legends have grown up around this hegira from which cook's life should be dated it is said that he quarrelled with his master it is said that he demanded to have his articles broken it is further said that in order to pay for a conveyance from the staithes to whitby he stole a shilling from the till the preservation of the till itself which was shown until quite recently has always been considered sufficient proof of this story of the stolen shilling true it is that on the spot certain of the oldest inhabitants endeavour to soften down the story to remove from it the more tragic elements which really constitute its strength and lend it a moral by alleging that james cook did not steal a shilling but that he exchanged an old for a new shilling by which his master was in no ways injured now the mute evidence of the till in no way supports this explanation it says plainly neither a shilling was stolen from me or it was not looking into the receptacles in the depths of me what do you think about the breaking of the articles the boy's parents were fifteen miles away and practically inaccessible articles of apprenticeship were not broken without a great deal of trouble and some expense boys who want to go to sea have never troubled themselves about legal formalities they run away robinson crusoe the leading case ran away james cook ran away he tied up his belongings one shirt and a jack-knife and his only handkerchief stole out of the house one summer morning at daybreak looked across the bay for a moment marked how the rising sun gilded the sails of the coaster a mile out at sea looked regretfully at the row of boats lying on the beach or anchored in the harbour and then strode away along the narrow street of the town where all were asleep except himself and as to that conveyance to whitby considering that the distance is no more than nine or ten miles or perhaps a little more by way of the cliff that there was then no road except a bridle path between any of the villages along that coast that there were then no carts carriages or vehicles of any kind running between whitby and the staithes and that he was a stout and sturdy lad we may without difficulty acknowledge that he did the little journey on foot and that if he took that shilling at all which a biographer who loves his hero may be permitted to doubt it was to provide himself with food until he should get what he wanted a ship this one feels quite certain is the exact truth but in order to make the thing perfectly clear let me borrow a page from the book of things forgotten a work too generally neglected by the historian on monday morning the fifth july seventeen forty two mr sanderson grocer and draper awoke somewhat later than usual he knew it was later because he heard the washing of the waves upon the staith the tide was up he remembered that the high tide was due at six o'clock that morning men who live by the sea always know the time of day by the tide and the time when high tide and low tide are due he got out of bed therefore being reminded at the same time by a certain heaviness of head that he had taken more beer than is needful for man's refreshment at the cod and lobster the night before then he dressed leisurely and descended the narrow stair into his shop he found to his astonishment that the place was still closed and as the sunshine streaming through the upper holes of the shutters showed that the floor was unswept and nothing set out upon the counter mr sanderson had his misgivings taught by past experience he said nothing he crept with silence and great caution to the corner where stood the instrument with which he daily admonished his apprentice grasped it and stole to the counter under which the boy made his bed at night intent on giving him a lesson short and practical on the duty of early rising one he thought that should leave a lasting impression there was no boy the blanket was thrown back the sacking on which he lay was crumpled up the boy had left his bed mr sanderson laid down the stick and tried the door it was unbolted and unlocked the boy had therefore gone then mr sanderson sighed and replaced the cane in its corner it would wait for the next apprentice for this one had run away and gone to sea he made no inquiries and had no doubts all the boys who were indentured to this good man ran away and went to sea he could not keep them though he flogged them every day 
they would go to sea where the floggings were more frequent and more various ranging from the dread cat with nine tails to the handy rope's end they would go james cook had only followed the others he remembered now that it was too late certain symptoms which should have warned him a new restlessness in the boy a careless weighing of the brown sugar a lavish rendering of a yard of welsh flannel and a certain wistful look in his eyes whenever he could steal to the door and gaze upon the water well he had gone to sea another apprentice must be found perhaps james would be wrecked and cast away or he might fall overboard or the ship might founder or he might get tired of the sea life and being unfitted for a landsman's drudgery turn vagabond highwayman footpad and so get hanged or he might become a steady and useful sailor and come back to give an account of himself with these thoughts he opened the till it was empty he remembered leaving a bright shilling in it on saturday evening it was empty the young villain he had robbed the till he took it in his hand and went to the door and hard by were the cobblemen leaning against the posts men said mr sanderson have you seen james cook he's run away and robbed the till of a shilling up spoke a grey-haired mariner robbed the till man thou robbed it thyself last night to pay the reckoning art too drunk yet to mind ye an oot for to money mr sanderson retired with his empty till but the word had been spoken and it was spread abroad in the staiths and contradicted and again reported that james cook had not only run away to sea but had robbed the till of a new shilling for there is a sticking quality about a lie particularly a lie which degrades if it is believed and to this day but the rest we know the good man took another apprentice and yet another and another they all ran away and went to sea except one who was preparing to go too when a putrid fever seized him caused by the stinking fish he departed too but not in the same way and now lies buried in hinderwell churchyard under a grassy mound and is forgotten the shop as has been already stated stands no longer the cotton lobster then the first house in the row under the south cliff is now the only house left for a few years after the flight of james cook there arose one night a mighty storm of wind and rain the waves came rolling in from the north the tide ran over the staiths and flooded the lower part of the town the people in this row of houses had to fly for their lives and one by one the buildings fell and were washed away before the tide went down all but the old tavern which still stands to show the kind of hostelry which was the fisherman's house of resort in the year seventeen forty or thereabouts the respectable sanderson saved his effects and furniture and his till the shop was reopened in a house higher up the house still stands but the shop is closed when mr sanderson at length concluded his pilgrimage one turner took it over in his place sanderson having no sons or which is possible all the sanderson sons having run away and gone to sea turner in due course gave place to one row who is also now gone and the shop is closed the till has disappeared and will no longer bear evidence the dumb helpless thing to an invention perhaps it has been acquired by the library of the royal geographical society or it may be among the treasures of the royal society i have looked for it in the museum of whitby but it is not there james cook came no more to the staiths the people however heard of him he was seen at whitby between voyages ten years or so later the news came that he had been pressed into the king's navy and one day twenty years and more after he had run away the news came to this little port that lieutenant cook nothing less if you please than lieutenant had sailed away in command of a king's ship bound for the pacific ocean whither men go to fight the spaniard never before in the memory of man had officer of the royal navy come from the staiths captains of fishing smacks even of colliers but lieutenants in the royal navy never why james cook was my apprentice said mr sanderson now old and shaken in his memory he ran away and went to sea and he robbed the till i he took a new shilling out of the till this very till it was a new shilling though they did say but here his memory failed him they cherish the memory of james cook's boyhood all over cleveland the strangers who visit the staiths from whitby or from saltburn are told where was the house in which cook served part of an apprenticeship 
at martin where the great sailor was born there is a school named after him at great ayton they show the house built by his father after the great sailor had left the place and the schoolhouse rebuilt after the great sailor had gone away there is a monument to his memory erected upon a hill near ayton for all the world to see and at whitby in the museum they have his portrait and a relic or two from the endeavour and a collection of south sea arms dresses and implements which though presented by various donors are accepted by the visitor as placed there in honour of captain cook and if you make your way to the little street where he was articled half a dozen of the people run forth instantly to point out the house End of section two section three of captain cook by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami before the mast part one the boy as the book above quoted goes on to explain turned to the southward when he reached the top of the cliff and walked across the fields through hinderwell churchyard to the road which in the year seventeen forty two was only a cross-country track and not a maid road at all leading to the village of lyth here he struck into the way along the cliff made by those who searched for jet and those who worked in the alum trade and so walked into whitby which he reached before the events already narrated concerned with the awakening of mr sanderson happened it was not yet six o'clock when he stood upon the west cliff on which there was not a single house and looked down upon the town below he saw a closely built populous place the houses stuck together as if to prevent each other from falling from the steep sides of the cliff into the port itself there were few streets on the west side except the stave itself the long quay behind which the houses began narrow courts with stone steps led up between the lower houses to those above the roofs were of bright red tiles the coal smoke hung over the town there was an inner port connected with the outer by a drawbridge already the town was astir the cobbles and the smacks had come in and were unlading their cargo a sail was going on loud and noisy the beetle was bawling the loss of a mare lost stolen or strayed and ringing his bell with many yeo hoes they were warping a ship out of the harbour from the dockyard beyond the inner port there came the beating of a hundred hammers wielded by those who built the sturdy whitby craft the children played about the quay sliding up and down the ropes and looking at the casks filled with fish to be sent up country and sold the carts stood ready for those who were waiting to carry the fish about the farms and villages whitby was awake and in the full swing of work it was then as now a busy and important place it had a population of nearly ten thousand many ships were built there it furnished ships and crews for the coal trade along the coast the whitby ships traded with norway sweden hamburg bremen danzig and st petersburg a large part of the baltic trade was in the hands of whitby her merchants and shipowners were wealthy and responsible persons whitby sent out whalers whitby sent to london iron stone alum and jet at whitby there were made ropes sails blocks yards and all kinds of gear wanted for ships and whitby was the centre of a great fishery in those days it had but one church the old church on the east cliff up the long flight of two hundred steps it was so crowded on sunday that although they had not yet pulled down the north aisle and built up the large square structure which now stands there they had already begun the construction of the galleries which are stuck all about the church wherever one can be placed they had also already squared off the roof put in the skylights and modernized the windows the name of the place was by some written white bay it is so spelt on the tombstone of a certain minister of the parish who died in the beginning of the century but this was pedantic the old name of the town strayonschal had long been forgotten which is a thousand pities in the same way the old name of the little hamlet three miles north thor de sa has been clean forgotten and changed into east row which is indeed a drop the boy saw the church on the east cliff 
and behind it the ruins of st hilda's abbey church in his day the central tower was still standing he saw one ship going out of the harbour and another ship taking her cargo on board he walked quickly down the west cliff to the quay boarded the ship and doffed his cap to the mate under the east cliff there is nestled the oldest part of whitby town here is the old town hall built upon a great central pillar thicker than those of durham cathedral with a pillar of more slender diameter for each of the corners here are two narrow streets running parallel with the cliff and half a dozen courts running up the lower slope before the cliff begins under the town hall is the market as you see it to-day so james cook saw it that day when he walked in from staithes pigs and sheep poultry fruit and vegetables are sold in this market for fish you can go to the quay on the other side many of the houses in this part of the town have got the date of their erection over the doors one is dated seventeen o four another sixteen eighty eight and so on by far the greater part of them are more than a hundred years old in the lower of the two streets courts nearly as narrow as the yarmouth passages run down to the water's edge or to houses built overhanging the water some of these are old taverns they have built outside broad wooden galleries or verandas with green railings and steps to the water where the captains or mates of the colliers could sit with a pipe and a cool tankard and gossip away the time between dinner and supper looking out to sea the while between the cliffs when the sailor is not afloat he loves to sit where he can gaze upon a harbour and ships and the blue water outside at the raffled anchor for instance even a sluggish imagination can easily discern james cook himself in his rough sea dress and tarred hands sitting among his friends and shipmates himself already having gained the quarter-deck he is a silent young man he refuses not his drink but he does not sing and bluster indeed the whitby mariners were ever a quiet and god-fearing folk though in the matter of drink but were they worse than the landsmen a picture of whitby of this date tells little that one who knows the place cannot discover on the spot the reconstruction of the town of seventeen forty two needs but the knocking down of the modern part and of a few shop fronts and recent structures the build of the whitby ship in the picture one is lying in the inner harbour has been little modified she is round in the bow broad and square in the stern her lines are laid for room rather than for speed her length is about three times her breadth in the picture just as now the houses cluster at the foot of the east cliff the dockyard is in full activity the port is full of bustle and business the book of things forgotten narrates that the ship in which cook offered his services was ready for sea that he was taken on board as ship's boy and proved himself during the voyage to london port and home a lad of quick parts and great activity insomuch that the rope's end was seldom required to start him and the mate though a choleric person found it unnecessary to cuff the boy unless he was actually within reach further that this officer interested himself being of a generous and humane disposition in the boy and advised him to get bound to the owners of the ship for a term of years holding out his own remarkable rise from the position of apprentice to be mate or first lieutenant of the collier to this rank he said the boy might himself reasonably and even laudably aspire though it was given to few to reach so dizzy an elevation in short he persuaded the boy for his own good the owners of the ship were two quaker merchants brothers named john and henry walker they lived together and had their office in the narrow street now named grape lane but then a continuation of sandgate their house now converted into two still stands a plain quaker-like house these worthy gentlemen received the lad as their apprentice bound to him for three years with the consent of his father and perhaps after the former articles with mr sanderson had been torn up and annulled End of section three Section four of Captain Cook by Walter Besant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Before the Mast, Part two.
the lad served out his time as apprentice first on the free love of four hundred and fifty tons employed in the coal trade and afterwards in the three brothers a fine new ship of six hundred tons on the rigging and fitting of which he worked while ashore this vessel was employed for a time as a transport ship in seventeen forty nine she was paid off at deptford and then employed in the norway trade while an apprentice he lodged at his master's house while on shore and the tradition still survives of his sober and studious conduct during those times in the year seventeen fifty he was on board the maria belonging to mr john wilkinson of whitby employed in the baltic trade under the command of captain gaskin in seventeen fifty one he served on board a stockton ship in seventeen fifty two he was appointed by mr walker mate of the friendship of four hundred tons he was also in the coal trade observe that for three years when this period of his life came to a close cook had been mate that is second officer on board a collier and that before that time he had been an able seaman in the same trade a rude training but the most effective possible it taught him seamanship thoroughly it taught him to understand the common sailor and to feel for him but it was not one imagines a perfect school of manners as regards the life led on board the merchant ship it seems to have been much the same as that in the royal navy the men were perhaps knocked about more and flogged less there was little discipline but much swearing cuffing and in case of mutiny the officers had to be ready to fell the mutineers with the first weapon that came handy a marlin spike a cutlass or anything as for the rations in general living i suppose they were much the same on a merchantman as on a king's ship and we shall presently see how the men lived in the royal navy in the middle of the eighteenth century as for the things the boy would learn they would all be summed up under the head of practical seamanship he would learn first all the parts of a ship and her rigging the sails the running and the standing gear and how to use them he would learn how to sail a ship how to steer her how to save her in time of storm and danger in the thirteen years that he worked for the quaker brothers there was plenty of time to acquire a thorough knowledge of seamanship this period indeed proved the foundation of the lad's fortune he became a sailor but for book learning i cannot understand how he could acquire any the captain and the mate would have one or two of the handbooks used by all sailors readers of this series have heard from mr clark russell in his life of dampier of a sailor's wagoner there was also the sailor's vade mecum containing all kinds of practical rules and information apart from such books i think there could have been nothing to help the boy he preserved however the thirst for reading first implanted in him by mistress walker at martin a boy with an active and curious mind never loses that thirst it is also reasonable to suppose since he was promoted and became mate of his vessel that his conduct and ability proved satisfactory to his employers he would probably have received the command of a ship but for the accident which changed the whole current of his life and enabled him to achieve the glory that belongs to the great navigators of the world early in the year seventeen fifty five though the country was then nominally at peace with france it was felt necessary for the protection of the colonies to send a fleet to the american station with orders to attack any french squadron which might be found in those waters where it was assumed that they could be sailing with none other than hostile intentions these instructions were given openly and were communicated to the french court by the ambassador the king replied that the firing of the first shot would be regarded as a declaration of war that shot was fired on the sixth of june but war was not formally declared before may seventeenth in the following year this was the last struggle by which great britain at the expense of millions of money and lives sacrificed by thousands succeeded in freeing her colonies from the european powers at the close of the war in seventeen sixty two the whole of canada the islands of st john and cape breton louisiana east of the mississippi the free navigation of that river and the province of florida had been acquired for great britain 
france retained nothing except the two islets of st pierre and miquelon which she still keeps unhappily the peace also allowed her the right of fishing on the banks of newfoundland which was withdrawn from spain this peace was signed in seventeen sixty three only twelve years later our grateful colonists took advantage of the expulsion of french and spaniards to throw off their allegiance to the british crown without accepting any part of the burdens laid upon the mother country in her long struggle for their protection the imminent war caused a press both hot and heavy in every part of the united kingdom nowhere was it so hot as in the port of london with its thousand ships and its tens of thousands of sailors at this moment cook's vessel the friendship of whitby was lying in the river although he was now a mate on board he was by no means free of the press gang or would his position on board a collier help him to any raiding on board a man-of-war above that of able seamen there was a way however better than that of being pressed it was to enter as a volunteer it must be remembered that the service was not then governed by the same rigid rules as now prevail a man might and sometimes did obtain a commission in the navy without going through the preliminary and lower ranks the branch in which a man with a practical knowledge of seamanship might reasonably hope to rise was that of master's mate first and master afterwards also it was not the branch in which he would have to encounter aristocratic influence and favoritism young gentlemen who entered the navy had no desire to become masters those who went into this line were practical sailors men as tough and often as rough as the common seamen who lived when they were at home at wapping poplar shadwell and stepping if they belonged to the port of london or at point gosbert and certain streets outside the dockyard walls at portsmouth if they belonged to that town cook at that time twenty-seven years of age resolved that he would not be a pressed man he would enter as a volunteer accordingly he repaired to a rendezvous at wapping where he entered as an able seaman on board the eagle sixty guns captain john hamer this was in may seventeen fifty five in october of the same year captain afterwards sir hugh palliser was appointed captain End of section four Section five of Captain Cook by Walter Besant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter three in the Royal Navy. Part one. Between May seventeen fifty five and May seventeen fifty nine is a period of four years. Cook became again an able seaman serving before the mast but he was to begin with a volunteer and he had been mate of a collier therefore he was not an ordinary pressed sailor as it is very well known that captain palliser took an active share in whatever was going on we may reasonably conclude that cook was also present in many of the actions of the time the war began as usual badly boscawen was sent out to intercept the french fleet and failed general braddock was defeated and slain on the other hand our cruisers and privateers almost annihilated the french trade in the west indies as many as eight thousand french prisoners with three hundred merchant ships were captured in those seas admiral holborn was sent out with a powerful fleet to cooperate with lord loudon in the reduction of canada but nothing was done in seventeen fifty eight the pembroke took part in the taking of louisbourg and the reduction of the whole island of cape breton in this action five french frigates were taken and five destroyed the french islands of guadeloupe descada and marie galante were taken in seventeen fifty nine the eagle returned to england but cook was no longer aboard this is the brief record of those four years what share cook had in these actions does not appear but when fighting begins no one on board can avoid his share of the danger at least it is certain that from the outset cook could never have been confounded with the ordinary able seaman 
nothing is more clear than the profound ignorance and brutality of the common sailor of the eighteenth century he had no forethought he was childishly dependent on his superior officers he had it is true the common virtues of discipline obedience endurance and bulldog courage but that was all he drank as much as he could get he threw away his money he lived for the day when for instance the resolution sailed out of the arctic ocean we read that the sailors put off their warm clothes and began kicking them about decks as if they would never experience any more cold the officers to save the things collected them and laid them by in casks a man who understood the art of navigation could not remain a common sailor in the naval records of the time one reads once and once only of such a man he was on board sir cloudsley shovel's ship the association this wonderful person calculated the course of the ship he discovered that the officers were out in their reckoning he knew that they were dangerously near the silly rocks he said so they hanged him for mutiny and the next day the ship ran upon these rocks and behold they were all dead men what probably happened was this on the discovery that there was on board an able seaman a volunteer who understood the art of navigation the man would have been picked out and kept on deck engaged in navigating the ship he would have been told off to help in the duties of the master one solitary scrap of paper remains in cook's handwriting which belongs to this period it is cut out of a book it is dated wednesday november third seventeen fifty six and it contains certain calculations apparently in navigation it is perhaps a rough or draft log-book therefore a year after his volunteering cook was no longer a common sailor but doing the work of the master's branch was he promoted to the acting rank of master's mate he was really made master's mate two years after his enlistment and appointed to the pembroke on board which ship he took part in the reduction of Louisbourg he was not without some interest the then member for scarborough mr oswald diston wrote a letter to captain palliser on cook's enlistment recommending the young man to his notice why should mr oswald diston interfere in his behalf fountain wentworth oswald diston was the fourth son of an oswald diston of hunmanby near filey they were a very considerable family lords of havercroft there were five sons two of them successively members for scarborough one was bishop of london all died without issue it is a long journey from great ayton to hunmanby but we may fairly suppose that it was at the request of mr scoto that the letter was written however that may be in the year seventeen fifty nine cook was promoted to the rank of master and appointed to the grampus sloop may the tenth when it was found that the former master of the grampus had returned to his ship cook's appointment was transferred to the garland it was discovered that the garland had already sailed cook was then appointed to the mercury so far then this young man had done pretty well to rise from a collier's apprentice to be master not master's mate but full master on board a king's ship by the age of thirty must be considered creditable indeed no doubt at the time cook thought he had touched the highest point we may now consider how far advanced he was at this time in scientific attainment his practical seamanship recommended him for promotion what was it that recommended him for the services he was immediately to perform kippis tells the story in words which there is no need to alter the destination of the mercury was to north america where she joined the fleet under the command of sir charles saunders which in conjunction with the land forces under general wolfe was engaged in the famous siege of quebec during that siege a dangerous and difficult service was necessary to be performed this was to take the soundings in the channel of the river st lawrence between the island of orleans and the north shore directly in the front of the french fortified camp at montmorency and beauport in order to enable the admiral to place ships against the enemy's batteries and to cover our army in a general attack which the heroic wolf intended to make on the camp captain palliser in consequence of his acquaintance with mr cook's sagacity and resolution 
recommended him to the service and he performed it in the most complete manner in this business he was employed during the night time for several nights together at length he was discovered by the enemy who collected a great number of indians and canoes in the wood near the waterside which were launched in the night for the purpose of surrounding him and cutting him off on this occasion he had a very narrow escape he was obliged to run for it and pushed on shore on the island of orleans near the guard of the english hospital some of the indians entered at the stern of the boat as mr cook leaped out at the bow and the boat which was a barge belonging to one of the ships of war was carried away in triumph however he furnished the admiral with as correct and complete a draft of the channel and soundings as could have been made after our countrymen were in possession of quebec sir hugh palliser has good reason to believe that before this time mr cook had scarcely ever used a pencil and that he knew nothing of drawing but such was his capacity that he speedily made himself master of every object to which he applied his attention another important service was performed by mr cook while the fleet continued in the river st lawrence the navigation of that river is exceedingly difficult and hazardous it was particularly so to the english who were then in a great measure strangers to this part of north america and who had no chart on the correctness of which they could depend it was therefore ordered by the admiral that mr cook should be employed to survey those parts of the river below quebec which navigators had experienced to be attended with peculiar difficulty and danger and he executed the business with the same diligence and skill of which he had already afforded so happy a specimen when he had finished the undertaking his chart of the river st lawrence was published with soundings and directions for sailing in that river of the accuracy and utility of this chart it is sufficient to say that it hath never since been found necessary to publish any other one which has appeared in france is only a copy of the author's on a reduced scale such were the services which he performed within a few weeks after his appointment as master it is clear that such work would never have been entrusted to a young man who possessed no other qualifications than the knowledge of handling a ship one does not generally step all at once from the rank of able seamen to the preparation of a most important chart and the examination of a difficult seaway nor were cook's previous services the only reason why he should be selected from all the officers of the fleet for the important duty special knowledge as well as special aptitude must have been understood these considerations prove that he already possessed special knowledge how he acquired it by whose assistance who lent him books how he found time or opportunity it is impossible to learn most of his knowledge must have been learned during the four years in the royal navy it must however be noted that there is no other case on record in which a sailor boy starting in the very lowest place with the humblest origin and the very smallest outfit of learning has so far succeeded as to be promoted at thirty to the rank of master in the king's navy and immediately afterwards to be selected for the performance of a piece of work requiring great technical knowledge and one would think considerable experience as for his personal appearance several portraits remain of him the best seems to be that by weber the artist of his third voyage every biography ought at this point when the keynote of the character is struck to establish clearly in the mind of the reader the true effigies of the man one is not interested in the personal appearance of james cook made of a collier but when james cook has become a master in the royal navy when the really important step in his career has been taken in the execution of special service by special appointment it is time that we should learn what manner of man he was to those who only looked upon him we know a man when we have seen him when we have spoken with him or heard him speak when we have read his books or his letters and when we know what he has done cook's voice is not often heard for the most part others speak for him and of him but his portrait remains he was to begin with over six feet high thin and spare 
his head was small his forehead was broad his hair was of a dark brown rolled back and tied behind in the fashion of the time his nose was long and straight his nostrils clear and finely cut his cheekbones were high a feature which illustrated his scotch descent his eyes were brown and small but well set quick and piercing his eyebrows were large and bushy his chin was round and full his mouth firmly set his face long it is an austere face but striking one thinks perhaps wrongly that without having been told whose face this is in the portrait we might know it as the face of a man remarkable for patience resolution perseverance and indomitable courage the portraits of navy worthies are sometimes disappointing the faces of some gallant admirals have even if one may respectfully use the word a fatuous expression no doubt the fault of the rascal painter that of james cook satisfies it is a face worthy of the navigator such was the appearance of the man tall thin grave even austere as for his personal habits he was as all agree of robust constitution inured to labour and capable of undergoing the severest hardships every north-easterly gale that buffeted the collier's boy in the german ocean every night spent in battling with the winter gales between newcastle and the port of london helped to build up his strength and endurance he was able to eat without difficulty the coarsest and the most ungrateful food on what luxuries are even the mates of a collier nourished great was the indifference with which he submitted to every kind of self-denial a man who felt no hardships who desired no better fare than was served out to his men who looked on rough weather as the chief part of life who was never sick and never tired where was there his like and a man who never rested he was always at work during his long and tedious voyages writes captain king after his death his eagerness and activity were never in the least degree abated no incidental temptation would detain him for a moment even those intervals of recreation which sometimes unavoidably occur and were looked for by us with a longing that persons who have experienced the fatigues of service will readily excuse were submitted to by him with a certain impatience whenever they could not be employed in making a further provision for the more effectual prosecution of his designs when we have read so far we are not surprised to hear that he was a man of hasty temper and liable to passion a man who was never tired never wanting to sit down and rest impatient of enforced leisure careless about luxuries incessantly at work how should he be anything but hasty and passionate when he found his plans obstructed by the weakness or laziness of men all that follows will illustrate the fidelity of this portrait the man commanded unbounded respect fear obedience and confidence from his crew what his private and intimate friends said and thought of him is unknown to us beneath the austere commander there was it is admitted by all a kindly and human heart we must look for proof to the journals of his voyages because of his private letters there survive only three or four addressed to his friend mr john walker of whitby his private life how he lived and talked at home and among his old friends and cronies is almost as much lost to us as the private life of shakespeare certainly he had some friends it is most likely that he had very few for if we consider the course of his life from the age of twenty-seven was not such as to continue the old friendships the rude sailors among whom his boyhood was passed the rough officers of the merchant service among whom he spent his early manhood those people could hardly have anything more in common with the most scientific officer in his majesty's navy james cook master occupied a rank very far above that of many of his former associates when one rises in the world it is necessary to abandon many old acquaintances those left behind are apt to complain but they forget the great gulf that success and promotion make between old acquaintances most of cook's old shipmates were still before the mast the rest were still navigating merchant vessels for the most part looking on a warm room in a whitby tavern with a pipe and a glass of punch 
as the only occupation worthy of a sensible man's time ashore with such as these what had cook to do nor indeed would he readily make friends in the navy except with those of his superior officers who discovered his worth and knew how to value his qualities he had few private friends if there had been many legends would have survived from some there would have been old men proud to tell how captain cook the great captain was an old friend how he would come and talk during the brief visits home what things he brought them from abroad a conch from tahiti a piece of coral from new caledonia a tomahawk from new zealand long after life is over for every great man there survive such memories for they have had their private friends but cook had no friends and no such memories are gathered round his name it is little more than a hundred years since cook was killed men are living still who might have talked with such old friends of cook why i myself who write this book have talked with a man who was a page to marie antoinette i myself but little beyond the tenth lustrum have talked with one who was a drummer boy to henry la roche jacquelin i have talked with those who fought at copenhagen the nile and trafalgar and had captain cook left private and personal friends i might have talked with their sons and heard what things the great man had said because their memory would have been cherished in the family again some men are so self-reliant and some are so constantly absorbed in their work that they want none of the sympathies and the supports of friendship when cook speaks of friends he means patrons i cannot believe that there were officers of the same rank with himself with whom he could talk of the social life of which he knew so little nor can i believe that there were cronies with whom he would sit in his front garden in the mile end road a cool tankard between them and a pipe of tobacco in their hands to gossip away the afternoon and while the hours from dinner to supper and i cannot further believe that any old intimacies had there been any with the whitby shipmates were still maintained therefore i think that cook had very few private friends End of section five section six of captain cook by walter besant this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter three in the royal navy part two the post of master which lasted until thirty years ago when it was followed by that of navigating lieutenant now also abolished was the survival of the sixteenth and seventeenth century practice of appointing as captain a soldier who had no knowledge of navigation but was to command the fighting the duties of the master as laid down in the sailors vade micum of the year seventeen eighty were briefly to navigate the ship under the directions of her superior officer to see that the log-book was kept to inspect all stores and provisions to stow the hold trim the ship take care of the ballast to observe coasts shoals and rocks and to sign vouchers and accounts in other words he was the chief executive officer on board his scale of pay shows the importance of his post it varied from four pounds a month on board a sixth rate to nine pounds two shillings a month on a first rate as the pay of a lieutenant did not exceed seven pounds a month on a first rate the master was thought of more importance than the lieutenant the surgeon was paid five pounds a month the captain eight guineas a month on a sixth rate and twenty-eight pounds on a first rate besides their pay the officers were entitled to the same rations as the men and though they commuted the rations and brought on board their own stores it is evident from the low rate of pay that for the most part the officers must have fared very little better than the men this indeed is abundantly clear from the pages of smollett the full weekly allowance of provisions for every man was as follows this was to be reckoned apart from fresh fish which was ordered to be distributed as caught without any reduction in the regular allowance on the whole comparing it with the modern allowance jack of the last century seems to have been better off than jack of the present seven pounds of biscuit one quart of peas seven gallons of beer three pints of oatmeal two pounds of pork six ounces of butter four pounds of beef 
twelve ounces of cheese as regards water one ton of water was allowed for every hundred men per month there were no rations of rum but the regulations provided that on foreign voyages where beer could not be procured the men might have half a pint of rum brandy or arrack in lieu of beer as yet no tea coffee or cocoa was served out to the sailors the national drink the drink of the people was beer they drank beer for breakfast beer for dinner beer for supper and beer at all other times when they could get it a gallon of beer four quarts or eight pints is it must be confessed a plentiful allowance an affectionate and kindly allowance for the daily drink its substitute when there was no beer of half a pint of rum or brandy would be more than most of us moderns would care to take in the day however much diluted no tobacco was served out but the purser could sell it to the men in some public place and in quantities not exceeding two pounds for any one man in one month half a pound of tobacco a week over one ounce a day is a liberal allowance jack no doubt already practised to float the delectable and delicate habit of chewing but as he was only allowed tobacco when off duty he must have found it difficult to get through an ounce a day that they did smoke pipes is certain from the general instructions in the duties of a lieutenant that he is not to permit smoking between decks as for the use of wine by the officers nothing is said the captain's table seems to have been always provided with madeira a favourite wine at sea that of the officers would be perhaps supplied from their own stores as long as these held out but it must be remembered that very few of the officers were men of private fortunes and even a lieutenant's pay would not stand the daily exhibition of madeira i can find no allusion to the drinking of tea or coffee in cook's voyages either as a daily practice or an exceptional thing but they had some vessels on board which they could use as teapots because they are mentioned by name when the spruce tea brewed in dusky bay is described certainly captain cook was not brought up on tea coffee or chocolate in september of the same year cook was transferred from the mercury to the northumberland a first-rate man-of-war the admiral's ship they wintered at halifax during the winter cook is said to have first begun the study of geometry mathematics and astronomy the amount of mathematics required for the practice of marine surveying taking observations making charts calculating latitudes and longitudes is not very considerable but that a man should actually begin the study of mathematics after thirty and after performing surveys and making charts can hardly be believed that cook spent a laborious winter working at these branches of mathematical science which are concerned with navigation that he advanced himself considerably and that he brought a clear head and a strong will to the work may be and must be believed the northumberland returned to england in the autumn of seventeen sixty two and on december twenty first of that year cook was married the following is the entry in the parish register of st margaret's barking essex james cook of the parish of st paul shadwell in the county of middlesex bachelor and elizabeth batts of the parish of barking in the county of essex spinster were married in this church by the archbishop of canterbury's license this twenty first day of december one thousand seven hundred and sixty two by george downing vicar of little wakering essex the signatures follow with those of the witnesses i am indebted to the rev canon bennett of shrewton and wilts for information respecting elizabeth batts which no one else now possesses she belonged to a highly respectable middle-class family connected with various manufactures and industries charles smith her grandfather was a courier carrying on business in bermondsey his son charles was a shipping agent in the custom house his daughter mary married first one john batts who was in business at wapping and secondly john blackburn in business at shadwell mrs cook's first cousin charles smith became a very successful manufacturer of watches and clocks his house and factory were in bunhill row his eldest son isaac who accompanied captain cook in his first and second voyages subsequently retired with the rank of admiral 
his second son charles of merton abbey possessed considerable property in merton and elsewhere for cook to marry into so substantial and respectable a family marks a social lift corresponding to his promotion in the navy there is more to say about this lady later on meantime my authority who remembers her perfectly well she lived to a very advanced age bears testimony to the full that her appearance in age showed how singularly beautiful she must have been in youth that her manners were good and full of dignity and that she was well educated she loved to tell how on the day of her wedding she walked with mr cook across the meadows to the church therefore she was living outside the town of barking as her grandfather came originally from essex she was probably staying with relations the newly married pair went to live in shadwell where mrs cook's mother then mrs blackburn resided afterwards they removed to the mile end road cook was now thirty-four years of age the spells of domestic felicity which he was destined to enjoy were both short and few four months after his marriage his services were applied for by captain graves who had obtained a grant for the survey of newfoundland accordingly in april seventeen sixty three he went out and surveyed the islands of miquelon and st pierre which had been ceded to the french by the treaty of peace and were about to be occupied by them this job finished he returned to england early in seventeen sixty four however his constant friend and patron sir hugh palliser having been appointed governor and commodore of newfoundland and labrador offered cook an appointment as marine surveyor of those shores a schooner the grenville was placed under his command and in april he sailed for his station every autumn he returned to england and every spring he went out again this is proved by the dates of his children's births the work lasted till the year seventeen sixty seven during these four years he executed a great amount of surveying and drew charts which are still in use he also explored a part of that great island of newfoundland the interior of which is still almost as little known as in the days when cook discovered its chain of lakes and followed up the streams in seventeen sixty six he contributed a paper to the royal society of london entitled an observation of an eclipse of the sun at the island of newfoundland fifth august seventeen sixty six with the longitude of the place of observation deduced from it there were not many officers in the royal navy at that time who were capable of taking such an observation or of making any deductions from it in the autumn of seventeen sixty seven he returned home his work in america completed and thus the second chapter of his life closed he was now thirty-nine years of age he had been at sea for five and twenty years but the best part of his life was before him all its honours its highest interest its best excitement its greatest rewards what followed were years of endurance and hardship he was prepared for them by his long service on the cold and stormy waters of the german ocean by the rough and simple fare on which he had subsisted from childhood by his long companionship with rough and illiterate sailors whose wants whose virtues and whose vices he knew better than any other officer of his time one knows not what may have been his ambition probably to continue in survey work and cartography one hardly supposes that after such an office as cook had held in newfoundland he would greatly desire to sail as master even on a first raider he could hardly have looked for such work as fell into his hands many men it is said fail because they never get a chance of showing the world what they can do this may be true of one or two professions the bar for instance or medicine but it is not true of any other calling least of all is it the case in the services where a man must be discovered if he be a good man there is however a better way of putting it many a man might rise to the highest distinction as well as those who do had they the chance as it is their chances lead them only to the lower heights thus there may have been other men in the service as well qualified as james cook to command on a voyage of discovery i doubt it but there may have been the man was ready the chance came to him and he proved himself equal to his fortune End of section six
Section 7 of Captain Cook by Walter Besant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4 The Great Unknown Ocean. On the 25th of September in the year 1513, Balboa first caught sight of the great Pacific Ocean. For two hundred years and more, the Spaniards regarded the Pacific as their own possession. The sea seemed closed to the world except by one difficult and dangerous portal this entrance itself was defended not only by its difficulties and dangers but by a strange superstition everybody it was observed who had to do with the first passage by magellan came to a bad end the captain was murdered in a brawl by the natives of the philippines roy falero one of his company died raving mad the sailor de lepe who first sighted the straits from the masthead was taken prisoner by the algerines became renegade and embraced the faith of the false prophet by which of course he lost his everlasting soul nay balboa himself was beheaded and when ships afterwards began to attempt the straits they were constantly driven back by winds and storms which seemed to have been engaged in the service of the castilian king the first however to sail upon these waters was ponce de leon two years after their discovery he caused two or three small boats to be carried across the isthmus and sailed along the coast about panama in the year fifteen seventeen he founded the city of panama four miles from its present site he also attempted to build ships on the pacific coast but was forced to desist because the timber he used became instantly penetrated and devoured by worms let us follow briefly in this chapter the history of discovery in the pacific ocean from the first launch of ponce de leon's boats to the time when cook sailed upon his first voyage you may take a great sheet of paper and lay down on its eastern side a short line of the coast round panama on the western side some imperfect fragments of the great islands of borneo sumatra and java the whole of the sheet save for these fragments must be painted black it is absolutely unknown as one navigator after another traverses the ocean a new line of light runs out wherever he leaves the beaten track each voyage outside that beaten track leaves a belt of light no more than twenty miles in breadth you will see that even after two hundred and fifty years the blackness of great portions is wholly unrelieved by any such broad line of light you will understand by such a method what kind of task lay before the men who set forth upon a voyage of discovery upon these unknown waters it was only six years after the discovery by balboa namely in the year fifteen nineteen that magellan found and passed through the straits which bear his name when he emerged into the pacific his idea was to sail across to the moluccas he therefore held a northwest course one which unfortunately for him caused him to pass by all the great archipelagos and the coast of australia he found certain small islands but their names and positions cannot with any certainty be laid down his ship reached the Moluccas in safety but without her captain who was lying buried in the philippines in the year fifteen twenty five a very important expedition was sent out to the pacific by the king of spain it was commanded by don garcia jofre de loyasa and consisted of seven ships and four hundred and fifty men he achieved the passage of the straits in safety coasted chile and peru and having reached the latitude of thirteen degrees north he steered a westward course along that parallel and arrived at the ladrones his course was afterwards blindly followed by the spaniards which was the cause why while they held almost undisturbed possession of those seas they made no progress in its exploration it was loyasa who discovered the north coast of papua meantime in the far east the extension of trade was causing the discovery of new lands san vedra sailing from gilolo followed the coast of papua for a good distance and discovered in latitude five north the islands which he called los pintaros and los buenos jardines 
in 1542, Japan was first visited. In the same year, Villalobos crossed the Pacific on the same parallel as Loyasa. After this, very little was done for some years. Many attempts proved failures, some through the difficulties of the straits, some through bad weather, some through the death of the captain. The islands of Juan Fernandez and Masafuera were discovered in 1563, those of the Galapagos in 1550. A chart of the Pacific in the middle of the 16th century, about 50 or 60 years after its discovery, shows the western coast of South America laid down tolerably well, except that of southern Chile. The coast of North America has been followed as far north as California, which in some maps appears as an island and in others as a peninsula. On the eastern side of the chart, one observes a part of China, a part of Japan, the Philippines, Celebes, Timor, and the Ladrones. There are one or two small islands laid down with no certainty of latitude or longitude, and the north coast of Papua is indicated. Nothing whatever is as yet known of Australia and New Zealand. There is, however, an imaginary southern continent laid down with great boldness. The existence of Terra Australis Incognita had in fact already begun to haunt men's minds. It was said that Juan Fernandez had actually landed on this continent and found there a white people, civilized, well-formed, and well-clothed. It was within a month's sail of Chile, but no one else ever found this continent. It was in the year 1573 that Drake climbed the hill and the tree upon its summit, from which could be seen both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. Almighty God, he exclaimed, of thy goodness give me life and leave to sail once in an English ship upon that sea. Now there was with the party that day an Englishman named John Oxenham, spelt Oxenham, this man, a fellow full of resolution, conceived a brilliant project. He would get together a party, cross the isthmus with them, capture first a small ship, then a big ship, and rove the seas, plundering the Spaniards and sailing whithersoever they listed. He partly carried this project into execution. That is to say, he got together his company, crossed the isthmus, and falling upon a small craft in the Bay of Panama, took possession of it. No more curious story belongs to this time of adventure, but the attempt ended badly because the party were not strong enough to take a bigger ship and had to run ashore where they were all captured and hanged. Thus the Pacific destroyed the first Englishman, as well as the first Spaniard who attempted it. The toll of blood thus exacted the ocean lay open to Drake. It is remarkable that he coasted North America to latitude 48 degrees north, in the hope of finding a passage to the Atlantic. Two hundred years later, Cook went out upon exactly the same errand. The way being now known, the distance and the comparative safety of the passage, voyages across the Pacific from New Spain to the Philippines and back again now began to be not infrequent. Many accounts remain of such voyages. From America westward, the ships always kept to the same parallel, that of thirteen degrees north, as nearly as possible. There was a fair wind and an open sea. The voyage generally took eighty days. From the Philippines to New Spain, the same course could not always be kept, but there was little deviation. The English, meanwhile, were by no means unmindful of this ocean into which Drake had led the way. Two or three unsuccessful attempts were made, that in the year 1582 by Edward Fenton and Luke Ward to get through the Straits, that in 1587 by Withrington and Lister. But in 1586 Cavendish sailed with his squadron of three ships, the Desire of 120 tons, the Content of 60, and the Hugh Gallant of 40, with crews numbering 123 in all and carrying two years' provisions. He sailed along the coast as far north as California, then steered on a southwesterly course for the Ladrones. On the way, as all the world knows, he fell in with the great plate galleon and captured her. Never was such a splendid prize as that of this great ship. She had 122,000 pesos of gold on board, besides an immense quantity of satins, silk, musk, 
and all kinds of precious things naturally this good fortune stimulated imitators cavendish himself made a second attempt but the great galleon was not to be taken by every one one after the other half a dozen attempts were made and all failed in fifteen ninety four sir richard hawkins for instance had the bad luck to be taken prisoner he and his ship the dainty such a misfortune daunted even the english courage for a while in the course of these voyages however the falkland islands were discovered by captain john davis who had already made three attempts to find the northwest passage and whose name survives in our maps in davis straits meantime the spaniards continued their voyages of discovery but in a languid way having indeed already more upon their hands than they could well manage mendana in fifteen ninety five departing from the usual track sailed across the ocean following as closely as possible latitude fourteen degrees south he was rewarded by the discovery of the marquesas new hebrides and santa cruz groups and in sixteen hundred a spanish expedition was sent to sail along the west coast of north america toward the end of this century the dutch appeared in these seas in fifteen ninety five the five ship expedition from rotterdam set sail they followed the usual line but steered northwards and touched at japan in fifteen ninety eight oliver van noort made the now familiar voyage in latitude thirteen degrees north during the seventeenth century the troubles and civil wars at home kept the english quiet it is the century of the dutch the spaniards however in the course of a voyage in search of the southern continent discovered it was in sixteen o six the coast of terra australis as for the dutch they sent out joris spielbergen in sixteen fifteen who sailed up the coast and defeated the spanish fleet they sent out le maire and schouten who discovered the strait of le maire to the great uneasiness of the spaniards they also found the admiralty islands in new ireland in sixteen twenty six the great nassau fleet sailed round the world but seems to have done little in sixteen thirty nine the dutch sent out an expedition to examine the east coast of great tartary and to discover the gold and silver islands but of course the greatest dutch navigator was Tasman, whose famous voyage was begun from batavia in the year sixteen forty two it was not until sixteen sixty seven that the french sailed upon the pacific in sixteen seventy captain narborough made his chart of the straits of magellan this was the only important british voyage of discovery belonging to the century to the end of this century belongs the period of the buccaneers which has already been treated at length in this series by mr clark russell in his life of dampier the adventures of the signet the roebuck the sink ports the duke and the duchess the names of morgan sawkins dampier edward cook woods rogers clapperton and shelvick belong to the rovers those of commodore anson byron wallace and carteret to the time when the spaniards could no longer pretend even on the authority of the pope to regard the pacific as their private lake no nation in the world has ever had such splendid opportunities as spain one reads at school how athens when its population grew too large could ship off a whole colony to some island not far removed one envies the simplicity of emigration in those days but a far greater ocean than the mediterranean was given to the spaniards from the year fifteen thirteen when the pacific was discovered down to the middle of the eighteenth century that is to say for two hundred and fifty years the spaniard lived secure fearing no danger from generation to generation in the warm air that he loved with a subject race to work for him in luxury at ease without anxiety and wealthy beyond any dream possible to the proud and poor hidalgo of the mother country it was an ideal life and it lasted for eight long generations during this time there was no doubt a continual stream from the old world of those who wished to share in these good things those who came first got the best but there was enough and to spare had the spaniard continued to possess the spirit of enterprise but he did not he gave no welcome to fresh blood he lost the old spirit of adventure he even lost his old courage he became greedy jealous and lazy had such a chance come to great britain 
every island in the pacific would have been explored long before the eighteenth century and if there had not been planted upon every island a little colony of ruling britons under their native flag it would have been because there were not enough britons to go around i say that the spaniards were practically undisturbed what did the successful raids of drake cavendish and the rest amount to in all once or twice the english devils took the great galleon but only once or twice in all these years now and again a town was assaulted and taken by these pirates but how many towns were taken how often were towns taken there was fighting at panama at guayaquil at acapulco at paita but where else the spanish americans feared little danger they ran few risks from generation to generation they grew richer and lazier the old courage of the spaniard had entirely left him by the third generation he could no longer fight life had become too easy for him but he remained in possession because there were none to turn him out all this was changed by the middle of the eighteenth century it seemed as if the great southern continent was actually going to be discovered at last and that it would not belong to spain an immense and apparently wealthy country called papua was now known to exist japan and china had to be reckoned with the dutch had possession of java and were pushing eastwards english ships were exploring the ocean once the spaniards own ocean in all directions the french themselves last in the field had appeared and it was evident to all that spain could no longer even pretend to keep out the other nations and besides the english brain was fired with the thought of the pacific as in queen elizabeth's time it had been fired with the thought of the west indies reports came home of lovely islands the english though as yet they knew nothing of hawaii and tahiti had heard of juan fernandez and Masafuera. they had read the voyages of woods rogers of clapperton and shelvick with anson they had visited the lovely tinian with its strange avenues of pillars they knew of the galapagos the sea lions of california the spice islands and the ladrones the tierra del fuego and its miserable people the long smouldering theory of the southern continent revived again scientific men proved beyond a doubt that the right balance of the globe required a southern continent otherwise it would of course tip over geographers pointed out how quiros juan fernandez and tosman had all touched at various points of that continent men of imagination spoke of treasures of all kinds which would be found there and would belong to the nation which should discover and annex this land they laid it down on the maps and reckoned up the various kinds of climate which would be enjoyed in a country stretching from the southern pole through forty degrees of latitude the most extravagant ideas were formed of what might be found fictitious travels fed the imagination of the people men confidently looked forward to acquiring a prolonged rule over other golden lands such as had been for nearly three hundred years the making and the unmaking of spain in every age there is always a grasping after what seems to promise the sovereignty of the world in every age there is a carthage to be destroyed and in every age there are half a dozen countries each of which is eager and anxious to enact the part of rome such is in brief outline the story many times told but always new of the principal voyages of discovery on the great pacific ocean it would be tedious and beyond these limits to attempt further details or to follow the tracks of these hardy sailors to those who love a tale of peril and of courage there is no better reading than that of the old voyagers from columbus the first of modern navigators down to captain cook the last we have seen the chart of the pacific at the end of the sixteenth century let us look upon it in the eighteenth before cook began to sail upon it the chart of seventeen fifty shows a very considerable advance upon that of fifteen seventy in the map attached to gordon's geography of seventeen forty there are certain instructive and suggestive things for instance new guinea and new holland are united only the west coast of new holland is given there is a small corner or angle of land which represents the whole of new zealand california is an island 
the ladrones are named and lie between latitude ten degrees north and twenty degrees south there are also certain scattered groups of islands nameless and apparently set down at random the map is exactly similar to that illustrating shelvick's voyage of seventeen twenty six save that in shelvick's map the islands are named turning to the letterpress gordon says under the heading of terra magellanica many things equally foolish as ridiculous are related of this country and its inhabitants with which i shall neither trouble myself or the reader and in section thirteen concerning terra australis he adds by terra antarctica we understand all those unknown or slenderly discovered countries toward the southern parts of the globe the chief of which do bear the names of new guinea new zealand new holland and which may comprehend them and all the rest terra australis incognita which southern countries though they belong not to the continent of america yet we choose to mention them in this place since the southmost part of the continent of south america doth extend itself farther towards the south than any part of the headland of the old continent leaving them therefore to the discovery of future ages we pass on end of section seven Section 8 of Captain Cook by Walter Besant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 Cook's Three Predecessors. So greatly has the fame of Cook eclipsed that of his predecessors that we are inclined to forget that his century produced other great navigators besides himself not to speak of foreign expeditions there were the voyages of anson byron wallace and carteret which must in justice to cook himself be touched upon before his own voyages are considered commodore anson's course presents no features of great interest like most of the early navigators he steered northward after passing through the straits of magellan touched at juan fernandez coasted south america stood in at panama went out to sea again appeared off acapulco and then sailed in the parallel of thirteen degrees north to the ladrones he added little to the geography of the world commodore byron's voyage seventeen sixty four to seventeen sixty six was almost as barren of results although like magellan he seemed to avoid discovering the archipelagos between which he passed by a kind of miracle he had with him the dolphin a man of war of the sixth rate carrying thirty-six guns with a complement of three lieutenants thirty-seven petty officers and one hundred and fifty men and the tamar sloop sixteen guns under captain mowat with three lieutenants twenty-seven petty officers and ninety men his general instructions were to sail in the southern seas and to make such discoveries and observations as he should find possible these instructions were not communicated to the men until they were well out to sea double pay was promised with other advantages he sailed to port desire north of the straits sighting the falkland islands on the way he then sailed into the straits as far as port famine when he was forced to put back again he visited the falklands they had formerly been known as hawkins maidenland or peeps land and then made another attempt to get through the straits they entered this terrible strait on sunday february seventeenth and came out of it on tuesday april ninth that is to say the passage of the straits took them fifty-one days which must not be considered a very long time considering the time spent by some ships in the passage captain wallace afterwards spent four months getting through de bougainville took one day longer than byron the weather during the whole time that byron was in the straits he describes as dreadful beyond all description on april twenty sixth the ships were off masafuera after leaving this island byron sailed north into latitude twenty six degrees south when like magellan he took a west northwest course and ran halfway across the ocean without sighting any land he then arrived at the northern end of the society islands discovering certain of the smaller outlying islands but missing tahiti and the more important places 
he then sailed northwest for the ladrones discovering one or two insignificant islands on the way it is an interesting voyage but one feels that the gallant commodore was not anxious to linger and indeed his crew was suffering too much from scurvy to allow further delay captain cook in his place would have put in at some island where he could have relieved and refreshed his men and would then have turned back but it is not every commander who can discover islands byron had not la main heureuse nor is it every commander who loves the perils of an unknown sea byron on his return was made governor of newfoundland and afterwards commanded a fleet to oppose the comte de Stagne in 1777 he died in 1786 the dolphin being refitted was sent out again in the year of her return under command of captain samuel wallace who had with him the swallow sloop captain carteret and the prince frederick storeship great attention was paid on this voyage to the shipment of medicines portable soup and other things for the prevention of scurvy the ships sailed on august twenty second seventeen sixty six they entered the straits on december seventeenth seventeen sixty six and did not get out until april eleventh seventeen sixty seven they actually spent four months trying to work through this abominable passage which is if one understands wallace aright about eight hundred and eighty miles in length wallace made however a careful chart of the whole straits and wrote a description of the navigation for use by those who should come after him on leaving the straits the dolphin sailing much faster than the swallow lost sight of her i would have shortened sail for the swallow says captain wallace but it was not in my power for as a current set us strongly down upon the isles of direction and the wind came to the west it became absolutely necessary for me to carry sail so that i might clear them soon after we lost sight of the swallow and never saw her again to the people on the latter vessel it looked as if captain wallace had crowded sail with the deliberate intention of deserting them wallace made no land for seven weeks when they discovered a small island or two about this time the diet of salt beef and pork began to produce their usual result in the appearance of scurvy the men began to fall down very fast vinegar and mustard were served out as antiscorbutics as much as the men chose to take wine was given instead of spirits also sweet wort and salop portable soup was also boiled with their peas and oatmeal the berths were kept clean the hammocks were frequently washed the water was rendered wholesome by ventilation and every part between decks frequently washed with vinegar yet the scurvy continued to spread nor was it until they reached a land where fruit and green food could be procured that the men recovered these preventive measures are necessary to notice in view of their helplessness and the sanitary improvements introduced by cook on his second voyage early in june wallace entered the archipelago of the society islands on the southeast side discovering island after island until they reached tahiti which wallace named king george the third's island it was fortunate for cook that his predecessor left behind him a kindly memory among the natives though their friendship began with a fight wallace's account of the place and the people occupies a great part of his narrative it is not so full and complete as the accounts afterwards given by cook by george forster anderson and king but it is highly curious and interesting no island of the pacific has been more thoroughly described as it appeared on its first discovery than tahiti of that pristine simplicity of manners how much now remains from the society islands wallace steered west and afterwards northwest for tinian and the ladrones another example of the way in which sailors one after the other used to make for the known points had he continued a westerly course he would have struck the coast of new holland had he steered southwest he would have anticipated cook and discovered new zealand satisfied however with the glory of finding king george the third's island he made for the ladrones on the way he found several small islands here follows a very curious and tragic little story 
on arriving at java he found the h m s falmouth lying in the mud in a rotten condition her ports were broken her stern post decayed and there was no place in the ship where a man could be sheltered from the weather the few people who belonged to her had been left in charge it is not stated how long or in what circumstances they had been left there or what had become of the ship's officers the story is an illustration of the delights which awaited a sailor at that time these people were the petty officers and one supposes some of the crew the decaying ship lay rotting in the stinking tropical mud while the men in charge waited for orders from england none came the dutch refused to let them sleep on shore when they were sick no one would visit them on board they were afraid that the malays would come and murder them and set their ship on fire the stores which they were left to guard had all been destroyed their powder had been thrown into the water by the dutch the masts yards and cables were all dropping to pieces and even the ironwork was so rusty that it was no longer worth anything ten years pay was due to them they had actually been in this horrible place for ten years they were growing old in this misery they expected that the next monsoon would break up the rotten old ship and drown them could there be a more miserable condition the gunner was dead the boatswain had gone mad the carpenter was dying and the cook was a wounded cripple wallace refused to relieve them they were left in charge he said and they must wait for orders from home so he sailed away nothing more is recorded of these poor fellows but the year after carteret who put in at batavia for repairs mentions the falmouth as a ship that had been condemned one hopes that somehow the survivors had been taken home and were already in the enjoyment of their ten years pay but one fears that their last home was in the warm mud of that fatal creek the dolphin anchored in the downs six hundred and thirty-seven days after her departure from plymouth sound this was a very quick voyage but as has been evident from the course taken it was straight across the ocean the voyage of the little swallow under carteret who had already sailed around the world with byron was by far the most interesting of any before those of cook it was also the most perilous the vessel selected for this long and dangerous service was a sloop thirty years old she was thinly sheathed and provided with nothing more than the barest necessaries the captain in considering the scanty equipment of the vessel was persuaded that the swallow was not intended to sail farther than the falkland islands in this he was undeceived the two ships kept company as already stated through the straits when the dolphin sailed away leaving her consort alone and without appointing any rendezvous none of the stores necessary to obtain refreshments from the natives cloth linen beads scissors etc were on board the swallow which was also unprovided even with a forge or any iron at the outset the ship was so foul that even with all sails set she could not keep up with the dolphin though the latter was sailing under topsails alone after a month of storm and rain with heavy seas the little vessel arrived at masafuera and now began in earnest a voyage with which none other can be compared for the resolution of the captain and the perils and discomforts of the ship's company with a small vessel imperfectly found without even the means of repairing a broken cable the commander would have been perfectly justified either in steering the shortest course across the pacific or in returning home through the straits carteret with the true spirit of a navigator did neither he cruised about in search of doubtful places he looked for certain islands laid down in green's chart of seventeen fifty three and also in robertson's elements of navigation and proved at least that their position was wrongly laid down even if the islands had any existence in these days of imperfect observation the true longitudes were generally arrived at after repeated visits and many observations he also proved that the so-called davis's land supposed to be a part of the great southern continent did not exist at least in the place assigned to it he discovered pitcairn's island but was unable to effect the landing 
he then like byron and wallace sailed into the archipelago of the society islands but lighted on the southern group the ship beginning to grow crazy and the crew being sick with scurvy carteret was compelled to abandon his wish to steer southeast had he been able to do so he might have anticipated many of cook's discoveries he therefore followed a northwest course but not as wallace and byron before him making for the ladrones and so by the north of the philippines to batavia carteret kept as long as possible south of the equator he discovered the queen charlotte islands he discovered and sailed through new britain and new ireland he discovered the admiralty islands joseph freewill's island examined the coast of mindanao sailed round celebes and so arrived at batavia had he been able to land procure refreshments and repair his vessel he would have steered southeast after leaving queen charlotte islands hitherto he says though i had long been ill of an inflammatory and bilious disorder i had been able to keep the deck but this evening the symptoms became so much more threatening that i could keep up no longer and i was for some time afterwards confined to my bed the master was dying of the wounds he received from his quarrel with the indians the lieutenant also was very ill the gunner and thirty of my men incapable of duty among whom were some of the most vigorous and healthy that had been wounded with the master and three of them mortally and there was no hope of obtaining such refreshments as we most needed in the place these were discouraging circumstances and not only put an end to my hopes of prosecuting the voyage farther to southward but greatly dispirited the people except myself the master and the lieutenant there was nobody on board capable of navigating a ship home the master was known to be a dying man and the recovery of myself and the lieutenant was very doubtful i would however have made a further effort to obtain refreshments here if i had been furnished with any toys iron tools or cutlery ware which might have enabled me to recover the good will of the natives and establish a traffic with them for such necessaries as they would have furnished us with but i had no such articles and but very few others fit for an indian trade and not being in a condition to risk the loss of any more of the few men who were capable of doing duty i weighed anchor at daybreak on monday the twelfth and stood along the shore for that part of the island to which i had sent the cutter when the ship at last arrived at Makassar, every man on board was ill with scurvy and the dutch in their usual spirit refused any assistance on march twentieth seventeen sixty nine nearly a year after captain wallace's return the swallow anchored at spithead the explanations of the former officer when the two gallant captains met are not on record i have thought it just both to cook and to the memory of these three his immediate predecessors to give a somewhat more detailed account of their voyages it will be observed that the zeal with which carteret carried out his instructions differed essentially from that which the other two brought to their enterprise byron and wallace had large and well-found ships yet they hastened to get out of the pacific as quickly as possible and by that part of it already known carteret had a small and ill-found old and crazy craft de bougainville who passed the swallow homeward bound reports that carteret's ship was very small and went very ill and when we took leave of him remained as if it were at anchor how much he must have suffered in so bad a vessel may well be conceived he had a sick crew and could get no refreshments yet he lingered as long as he could in the ocean and but for impossibility would have explored the southeast pacific then wholly unknown perhaps the known zeal of the younger man caused wallace to sail out of sight as quickly as possible after passing through the straits the chart of the pacific therefore had been enriched as the result of these three voyages first by the group of the society islands of which byron discovered the northern isles wallace tahiti and carteret those to the south byron and wallace did little more carteret discovered the queen charlotte islands pitcairn's island separated new britain from new ireland and found other small islands end of section eight